Welcome to Fierce Female Filmmakers, a production of Artemisia's Daughters, a non-profit organization that aims to inspire, empower, educate and employ women of all ages and backgrounds in the film and TV industries. My guest today is Ludovica Isidori. She's an award-winning cinematographer. She's a graduate of the American Film Institute with a number of feature films, shorts, documentaries and television under her belt. And as her name strongly suggests, she's Italian. <laughs> Ludovica, welcome. <laughs> Hi, good morning and thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, being a cinematographer, being a, a DP, I am asked all the time, what does... What is a DP? Oh, it's a director of photography. Okay, so so they 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 hold the camera, they point the camera. There's a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> do you want to explain what more there is to it? Because I'm sure you'll do it so much better than I can. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your job. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, um, I have to say, I was like briefly mentioned before that like up until here's like, 10, 12 years ago, I didn't even know that there was a job called director of photography because even though um, my mom has always been a lover of cinemas and she brought me to the theater and to the movies like since I was five or six years old, um, I come from a family of doctors. So my mom's a doctor, my dad is a doctor, my brother is a doctor, and I was supposed to go to med school. I just changed my mind the night before. And... Um, Yes. For, you got into you got into med school and you just didn't go. Yes, correct. Um, what was what was that moment? What what was no t stop? What was that moment when you just went? I can't go through with this. This is not me. Did you know then that it had to be film or creative, or was it just an absolute fear of stepping into a profession that you just didn't want to do? It um, it was more a sense of I'm not sure what I want to do with my life, but. I want to try something else and like probably was because like I'm the baby of the family and so people um told me that for a lot for for numbers of years I kind of react like not rebelliously but sort of like um in antithesis to what was expected of me and um and so it was kind of this uh self-defining act of like no, I know you want me to go to med school and I know that like everyone that gets in is supposed to go, but let me try something else and let me explore. And I think that was a great choice I made because it was almost allowing myself to get some time to figure out what to do with my life and my career. Also, you know, studying in Europe, it's much easier in a way because the financial burden is not as heavy as it is in America because we have semi there's a lot more support for people yes yeah. not so much in the UK you still have to get a bank loan but the bank loan is there yeah. for you to go to school or and, and any kind of university yes yeah. and and you know and it was like a few thousand dollars so you can to some extent uh try a path and then change your mind if you have to but so I just wasn't sure. And I was like, okay, there's this thing that is called media and communication. And I got in as well. And I was like, okay, let me try that. Let me see what it is. <laughs> um, but again, I still was like far away from even dreaming of becoming a cinematographer, even knowing, like I was just starting to understand that, you know, the movie industry had way more jobs and way more professions than, you know, the classic being a director or being an actor in front of the camera and um and so i almost like stumbled upon my work because later on when i was doing a master in tv and cinema uh which was much more oriented uh towards film critic and like writing about movies and writing about photography and working critically um for either, uh, you know, for, for both. Um, I met this guy who was my boyfriend at the time. And while it was a terrible um, love relationship, it was great professionally because we started making short sure movies together. And he was, was he a film? What kind of a, was he a director? It was a very, very entitled young man. Um you know, the type of guy who like knows it all and isn't, 
it was the best and it was an author and it like you wrote and directed it was like you know a personality and uh therefore there weren't that many uh jobs left uh to pick from and but you know and one of those was like to be behind the camera in a way it was like away from the spotlight still very you know um still very much part of the process but without the fame and without the glory and without the glitter and uh, i thought it was perfect for me so, so yes but you can't just pick up a film camera and start shooting and knowing about light and f stops and things you didn't you have a photography background you'd done you'd worked with a fashion photographer yeah so at the same time i was working for a fashion photographer and um and a photography curator so i was training on both the technical side and the artistic and curatorial side of what the thought process that goes behind creating an image. So I had an education, but you know, when you're like making short movies with your friends and your boyfriend, like you just learn from your mistakes and you just explore. It's like, okay, we have this camera, we have this two garden lamp. Let's try to, to create an image. And if it works once, great. If it doesn't, okay, next time, let's try to figure out what it is that wasn't working. And you don't really have the pressure. Like the only pressure was my boyfriend and his grandiose dreams. But besides that- I know, love that. <laughs> I can just see him standing there like Orson Welles, you know, <laughs> with his megaphone and his jack boots going, cut! <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, this is becoming something of a theme as well in these discussions, in these conversations, where the boys have it all. And what they have is this this, this confidence in their DNA. And somehow, as women, I consider myself a very confident female. But when it came to my film, I was like, oh, have I made the right decision? Oh, they're telling me that's not going to work, but in my head it's going to work. And all the time, constantly second guessing. And I, all the male directors that I've worked with at, when I was an actress, I never saw that. If they were doing it, they were keeping it very quiet indeed. So do you think, do you think that actually him being so grandiose and so sure of himself, was that actually, like you said, it was sort of like, I need to take a leaf out of his book and and try and be more like that? Or were you still quite happy to be the, the cinematographer? I was uh, thrilled. I actually had, without the, I think like somehow without the spotlight, I had a space I, I had the, the opportunity to carve a space for myself where I was um, exploring the medium exploring the camera but also uh, learning to to create and appreciate a safer space which I think uh, helped me in you know in my career is still helping me um, to sometimes when I'm behind the camera when I'm operating as well which is you know, one of my favorite moments and you have an actor in front of you, I try like everything I can for them to almost forget about the camera and about myself and to create this very quiet, intimate and respectful place for them to just be and to just occupy the space. And and I think that's when the magic happens. Like when you're behind the camera, also I'm, I'm very tiny, like I'm 5'2". So it's easy for me to, you know, hide behind the camera uh but that creates something quite wonderful because you are removed from it and like you become one tool with the camera and then at times something happens and like you have this perfor the performance just like unfolding in front of your camera in front of the lens and it's just like captivating it's, it's really magical and i think that's what i've learned to like Realize and being quiet and, and, you know, create safety and almost like not disappearing, but melting into something else. And like while putting your ego aside, it's so important for what we do um, 
Because that's very interesting. I really love the way you're framing that, how actually you have to have the confidence, but you, because you have to put yourself there as a creative individual and part of this, this team that's the, of a film crew. But at the same time, you have to, the dichotomy is that you have to let your ego just take take a back seat and let the now let the you've done all your prep you've set your lights we know what the shot is going to be we know if there's a dolly dolly move in it we know if there's a a push in or a put or or whatever Mm -hmm. and once that is set in place it's the it's the actor's turn that's yes that's that's really fascinating i was just saying and i think that's key to the bigger process of filmmaking in general i I was literally just talking to a director and um, we both agree with the fact that I think at the beginning, when you approach the the craft as a DP, a director, a writer, like you have this dream of like every shot is going to be amazing. Every word I write is going to be memorable. And you realize that that's your worst, worst work because it's again, not about you. And it's not about like, uh, being recognizable from like shot number one it's actually the ability to expand yourself become part of something much bigger than just you and somehow like being able to share the universe you envision and you create and with someone else or multiple people and to like reshape and remold that to something that becomes the story and it becomes like supportive of the story. Yes, and and all of those different elements, it becomes greater than the sum of those parts because everybody is is working towards the same goal. But as we know, that doesn't always happen because you either have a, you know, especially my experience in doing Uh, short films or even my feature film, which was super low budget, that you have a lot of people that aren't very experienced who are getting their experience on your film and they're super keen, but you can't, you can't make them more experienced than they are. And so there's a, there's another job there to keep everybody up to speed. And, um, and I know my greatest fear as the director was that we weren't going to shoot everything that day. We weren't going to get our day because we were lingering on this. It seems you're constantly running on a gravel beach up a hill to, to make, as you said, the most beautiful shot, allow the actors to do what they do, but at the same time, not waste any time. It's, it's the most, it's the most thrilling and, and um, frightening thing I've ever done. Uh, but I, I love it. And, and I can tell you do too. So take me back a little yes. bit to, I'm, I'm assuming that the grandiose boyfriend was Italian. Yes. You were in Italy doing that. I was. Yes, of course, of course. And um, when, <laughs> when did you make the move to America? Was it when you got a place at AFI? Yes. So basically um, during one summer, I, um, because my mom is, is a doctor and she, um, deals with um, kids with autism. She's an art psychiatrist for kids. Um, we had access to a group of family with very young boys um, with autism. And so we decided to make a documentary, which was really low budget, but a wonderful experience. And um, so I had something, you know, to like in my reel, let's call it that way. And then life took a turn. My stepdad died things evolved, the grandiose boyfriend uh, broke up with me and, and create some tragedy, you know, like very drama, Italian style. Um, it just can't be you anymore, Ludovica. It has to be something else. I don't know what, but exactly. it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he sounds hilarious. You have to put, well, you're not, a, maybe you need to write him into a movie to get somebody to put him in a movie. I love, <laughs> I love this part of your, the movie of your life already. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, like, you know, that's the best part. Life sometimes is much more creative and unexpected that, you know, that you can ever write about or, like, imagine. But to cut it short, I, like, had to to leave Italy for a minute. And so I went to New York, took some photography courses just to, like, take a break. 
And while there, I flew to Los Angeles to uh, meet a friend who I met during an exchange year in Amsterdam. And, uh, and she was going to AFI, which I never heard of. And, um, and, you know, when you hear about AFI in Los Angeles, everyone is like talking about this um, illustrious school with so many resources and like all these like famous directors and DPs coming out of there. And um, so I applied but without telling anyone. Tell me some of, tell me some of the directors. So, like Arnofsky and in terms of DP. Uh, I think like Bob Richardson went there and uh, uh, Matthew Libatik went there and Rachel Morrison were there. Like there's quite a few. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a, if you got to go there, you were walking in the footsteps of, of people who'd done very well for themselves. Of giants. And, uh, and, you know, it's a highly selective school. They take like 28 people per discipline out of hundreds of um, application and, um, I don't know, I was like fascinating because I, I went to one of their classes who took place in a sound stage and, the, and they had all this like huge lighting that I've never seen in my life. They had 35 millimeter cameras and I was like, wow, at my school, we had a 5D, <laughs> you know, very, very different. So I decided to apply, um, but again, not telling anyone and just out of curiosity and life wanted to, you know, make something happen for me. And I got a call. Uh, I still remember to this day while I was in the McDonald's in Milano, like sitting out with a friend and, uh, and they told me I got in and, and I just go through an interview, you know, and that was it. That was like, um, that's fantastic. Yes. I, I, I'm getting that little, my heart just skip to beat because I just know that feeling of oh it'll never happen if it did happen it would be amazing but just put it aside and then when you get the phone call you just leap out of your chair it's just wonderful mm -hmm. so now life had to bring you back to Los Angeles and how long is the course there at AFI? Two years and uh yeah, and since then, you know, after, you know, you tell your old family, like, hey, and like the the mentor and, and boss I was working with, I was like, listen, this happened. And uh, he was, it was this amazing man working at a museum and creative photographic, creating photographic exhibition and writing book about history of photography. And he told me, listen, Ludo, America happened once in a lifetime, so you got to take it. And um, it was amazing. Like, you know, again. It's those once in a lifetime moments. Yes. Yeah. Yes. One of those things that like, you know, even like one of those people who are like, yeah, ego aside, like, I'd love to have you working for me, but this is your future, you know? And so I just went there and I had to say, you know, goodbye to my family. Like, it's, it's you know, like in Los Angeles, Italy is like at least 16 hours. So it's, it's quite a... It's quite a choice, uh, but sometimes, you know, again, like life makes things happen for you and, and you, just, you just have to go. And so I came here. That's fantastic. Went through two years of AFI. They're like really, really hard um, because, you know, you're in a different... Just can you describe to me a little bit um, the course and what kind of classes and and how you approach that? Yeah, so... The beautiful thing about AFI is like it's um it's a conservatory and it's divided into disciplines. So if you take cinematography, what you're gonna do for two years, it's focused on cinematography. And then you have a course for directing, and then you have a course for production designer. Um but so it's highly specific and um it, we which I think at that point um of my career but also of other people um is what makes it so worthy, um, and, and also it's why you have people who have been, for instance, working in the industry as first ACs for like five years, who then decide to take the course because it's it's really highly specific, and that's also why I think a lot of people coming out of there uh, have very brilliant career after. And all you do because you, it, you're just loaded, you're loaded with so much information and training. Yes, yeah. you have like class during your first year, I think you have like 
class Monday through Friday, and the only break you have is Tuesday morning for three hours to literally make laundry. That's the only time you have to do that. And uh, and then you shoot. You have three short movies that you shoot during the year. And as a director of photography or as a cinematography alum, you have to crew for your fellow every other weekend. So you're constantly in school. So you, you, you're like go through classes, Monday through Friday, eight to 12 hours a day. And then the weekend you work on set. So it's super intensive. So there's not even a chance of being a student and having another job to pay for your classes. You, you are you are fully immersed in it. Yes. I, my, my drama school was like that. When you weren't in class, you were in plays that were being done by the directing students. And you were, you know, so you rehearse till nine o'clock at night, go to the pub, wake up, little hungover, go back to school again. I mean, you look back on those times. I look back on those times and it was the best, the best time of my life. When you're learning, when you're absorbing everything like a sponge, you don't count the hours. You don't worry that you're working all weekends because you know it's this very short period of time that will go past in a second. You know, it just, it, it, it goes so quickly and all of a sudden you're graduating and now you're this newly minted cinematographer or actor or whatever. And, um, and now you go, okay, now what am I going to do with my life? So what did you do with your life, Ludovica? <laughs> Who did you, did you, did you just go, right, where's, where's the next film to shoot? You, you just kept going after you graduated. So basically, yeah. Um, again, because my um, background was not as technical and it was not as, like, you know, I didn't have, like, yes, I had a bachelor and a master, but it, it was a lot of, like, mm, theoretical knowledge about cinema and, and photography. But, like, I didn't really have that much practical experience for the first couple of years after I graduated I basically I kept working as a camera assistant uh to pay rent so you gotta do that um but then I just took every single student thesis and student shorts and student movie I could put my hands on um most of the time being non-paid and at times actually paying out of my own pockets to just afford crew because one thing you learn very early on which also ties into something you were talking about before um you're only uh, i think it's true for everyone but especially as a dp you're only as good as your crew and i think the more you practice the more experienced you become the more you understand that uh like your the next step in your career is when you can't or you're not willing to just have students working for you as your crew not because you can't teach them that it's always something wonderful to do and like giving back and teaching people and sharing experience is fantastic but if you have a project you're doing if you're having a short movie and you have three people that can work in your group in electric they can't all be students they're just not they're not going to make you a better DP, you're just not going to learn anything. And you're also not going to have the time to, you know, teach them something like you need to make sure that the level of experience and expertise of your career is balanced, then maybe, you know, maybe you have four people, then maybe three are super experienced. And the third and the fourth one, it's someone you can train. And that's totally doable. So yes. you can reach your result, make, make your day make the director happy. Uh, and also teach someone else. Yes, I've I've had this exact conversation with um, Kit Fraser, who uh, DP'd my first two films, uh, short films, and, and I was like, you know, we can get students. We can just, you know, he said, no, no. He said, don't pay me, pay my crew, my guys that I work with all the time, because I promise you everything will go so much faster. You will be happier and I won't be waiting on somebody who doesn't quite have the initiative or the experience. And it's it's a shame because maybe there's fewer opportunities for people to learn. Um, but 
if you're also the short film maker, you're learning and you don't, you know, we're all learning together, but there can only, there has to be a balance and the balance has to be tipped towards the people. You want to work with people who have more experience than you, who are better than you, so that you're learning, you know, and, and getting the best results. It has to be, you know, I feel like every short you do, every project you do, um, you need to either have a challenge or learn something or... Um, and, and I think understanding your boundaries, it's also part of that. It's part of that growth, you know, like, yes, at the beginning, as I told you, like I took every single job because I needed one to boost my confidence, but two, to really like learn the skills because to go back to your very original question, being a DP is more than just knowing lighting. There's a lot that gets into it. There's a lot of aspect to it. And so those are all things you need to learn and you can only learn with practice. But I think a very important skill that we need to learn, I think especially as women or minorities in general, is one, we have some financial worth um, and not that we need to become millionaire. But I think at some point, putting a number to your work helps just in terms of affirming your worth and then if you want to do a favor to your friend you do well and you can afford to because you made money on the project that really could afford to pay you what they pay the boys is that that what you're referring to is that oh well we'll get we'll get the girl dp because she'll be she'll be more affordable we'll be able to you know we'll save a couple hundred bucks a day which unfortunately it happens more than once you know and but i think that's also on us to like start uh, affirming ourselves. And that's the other element. Like, yes, I think there's some sort of imposter syndrome that we are like raised with. This idea that like wherever we get is, oh, maybe because somebody like do us, did us a favor or because like someone else wasn't available or, and it's like, no, maybe it's because we are good at what we do. And, in, and, and once we understand that, we also understand, again, our, our limits, our boundaries, our needs, and like, you know, okay, this is a short movie we're going to make. This is the resources we have. Uh, we're going to, like, I think it, it, part of being a good manager and a good leader, uh, which a DP needs to be, is also understanding, you know, how to ask for things and what things are the minimum requirement, whether it's an extra day or an extra person, or a few extra bucks to like have your keys that are a little more experienced so you can actually get a few students to train, you know, and, and create that balance. Um, but it becomes necessary. Otherwise, you just like go to set and you just rush against time and become frustrated and don't get the result you want. And like, well, the unexpected happens and why, you know, last minute emergency happened. We've all been too set. I think it's our, uh, we need to learn how to ask for the minimum, at least. That's a really good point. Can I ask you something else as well? Um, have you had any feedback from directors and producers that have made a distinction between a, a male cinematographer and having hired you, that their experience with a with a female DP was different. Um, of course, I would say better, but it, it, it has anybody ever said, you know, this is something really interesting, and we had a different dynamic this time because of because of of somebody because of a woman in a role that's just always done by a man. It's a, I think it's a complex answer because one, I believe in the fact that if you and I DP the same movie, you're going to have two different movies. Like it's, there's an, an element of uniqueness, not because we're all snowflakes, but because, you know, my background compared to yours or my personal experience compared to yours. And so I think like every individual bring something different to the table. Now, the, and also I think there's something that 
has to deal with our ego, uh, at least with mine, which is I don't want to be chosen for the job because I'm a woman or a female DP or because that's in vogue right yes. now. Yes, because. That's how I say it. I'm not a female director. I'm a director. You know, I, there has to be a certain moment when you make that distinction. We make it and we move on. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and again, also because right now I feel like it's hard to say, but um, some studios or some projects, they like hire you because you're like, you know, part of the minorities, whether there's like person of color or LGBTQ or woman. And because it's like, they, they can check the box and it's like, eh, I'm more than a box. Now, that being said, if that brings us more jobs for now, sure, let's take them. Yeah, you know. yes, exactly, exactly. And, you, and you're getting more experience and your, your rate can stay where it is until it goes up a bit and up a bit. Yeah, it is, it's a dichotomy of am I ticking a box or am I... Uh, are you do you really love my work have you re that's when you say you know have you have you seen this film that i shot have you have you researched my work oh, oh okay. but <laughs> but and that's true i think there's like a times director of preferences based on um the content of the the story and i'm not saying that like women are the only one who can tell female stories the same way, like, you know, it's not because I'm Italian, I can only tell Italian stories, but there are certain uh, stories that do, and a certain director who appreciate uh, similarities in, like, I don't know, like I shot a movie about consent and um, there were certain scenes where probably the fact that I was a woman made it easier to an extent for the actress to feel safe the same way if I were to you know um for example shoot a, a movie about a coming of age of like a young boy and at any point the the director was like hey there's like a locker room scene or whatever you know where this boy would much rather have a guy in the room I would be the one being like like facilitating finding a solution whether it's like I think a camera operator for a day who's the man or like, you know, because I think it's there, there are certain themes and certain scenes that require more care. Yes. Yes. That's very interesting. Talk a little bit about Test Pattern. That's the, the film that you shot about consent. Um, and I want to direct any listeners to um, an AFI interview you did where you talked very very deeply and very um, in a lot of detail about the shots that you chose and the colours. And um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that now because it really does stand out. I, I haven't seen the whole film, but I've seen the trailer and, and knowing the subject matter and, and having heard you talk about it, it really was fascinating to link link the idea of the the theme of the film with color and light would you would you talk a little bit about that for us absolutely first of all listener support indie movies and indie filmmakers um if you are i think in america i think right now it's only available in america but it's on like um itunes and amazon and the movie is called test pattern and the director is shatara michelle ford um, it's available for rent and again I think it's I love the movie but I shot it but I think it's, it's a good thing to promote it um, just because it is important that it, indie filmmakers get some you know rewards or absolutely absolutely and I'll put I'll put those links and I'll put that information in in our information box as well on the podcast so so none of that will get Thank lost you. Yes. um but yeah, so the movie, uh, again, it was a movie about consent in m multiple ways, meaning it was a movie about a sexual encounter uh, that crossed the line of consent, but it was also a movie about an interracial couple and how um, consent and the line of consent is sometimes crossed, um, in this case, by the male partner, it was a white male in a relationship with a, um, a black woman and uh, you know the ways we sometimes 
cross boundaries just for our own safety and, and our own um, feeling of security without even realizing that. So I think th what we were trying to achieve um, with the story and with the cinematic language was trying to depict a story that wasn't just like black and white. I think too often we see or we've seen movies about sexual encounter and sexual assault uh, where the assaulter um, is the bad guy that comes out of darkness in, in a street and too easily people tend to put distance between themselves and the experience they're watching being like, oh, but I'm not a bad person. I'm not that guy. And I think everything we did with this pattern from the use of color to the use, mostly like camera moves was trying to create a story that wasn't to that either even if it um borrow some elements from horror and more traditional filmmaking was a story that was in a way e more easily to empathize with and to just be like oh okay so situation can go wrong and situation who which are okay and fine up until a moment can turn and that that's when the con and so we had a few interviews. I saw Shatara, uh, director, having a few interviews because um, there we use color in the movie, and um, that was also in collaboration with the production designer Eloise Ayala. And that's to anyone who ever wants to become a DP, uh, production designer are going to be your best friend. So fight for them because. There is no way you can create a cohesive cinematic universe with certain elements, color, it's one of those, without the help and the contribution of the production designer. I, 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 my film won um, a cinematography award and um, the I was there at the festival. Unfortunately, the DP wasn't. Um, it was in New York and he was back in the UK. And the first thought that came to my mind was to say, and it felt very obvious, like your medium is pictures, it's images and images have colour. And you've got this tool there that, that lends itself. You can choose your colors that underscore the mood or the story or the drama. And to not utilize that from your production designer all the way through to the DP and costume as well, colors with costume. Yeah. It, it seems like obvious to say it, but I think a lot of times young filmmakers, uh, you know, uh, when they're starting out, they're just so desperate to tell the story and get the actors walking and talking and doing everything. Whereas for me, my background is acting, but I also love design and architecture and space and negative space and positive space. I understood all of that. And then colour and light, even though I'm not skilled like a DP, I was really aware that how important that was and and how that contributes and i i do think i do think a lot of people a lot of filmmakers don't always consider that it takes the dp to say what kind of mood do you want here what kind of colors what kind of light yeah and i think like so there's there's a couple of scenes in this pattern uh which people brought up for different reasons some people really liked it some people really hate it and in uh, let's say a couple of shots and it's like extreme close up of her actress so you know very simple shot and one is her um after her drinks get spiked in a car so she's like in and out of it and there's this like purple pink light through it and then there's another shot where she's in a doctor's office at some point and she has this window behind her it was just this, like highly blown out white limbo you don't you can barely feel it's a window um, again, we had contrasted response to it, but we had response, which is, I guess, all you want to do with a movie, like creating a, a reaction, you know, and starting a conversation. And in both cases, and, and especially in the, uh, in the scene with the purple and, and pink light, she's in a car. So 
really there is no light, there is no CD with like purple and, and, and pink. And that wasn't a conversation with, with Shatara. It was more like, okay, let's let's build this up and get to a place where we communicate something emotionally. And I remember it showing to her on set and she was like, I love it. And it was like, a, it was a response. It was like, a, I just trigger something like under her skin or like a bodily reaction that was immediate. And was there a motivation for it? Not really. It just felt right. And I think it's sometimes you have to trust your gut. And um, take, take me back a bit. So, so you have had people go, what the hell's that purple light doing in that car shot? Is that pretty much what, what yeah. the response has been like? A lot of people really enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, we had a couple of people saying that the same way I had a couple of people like uh, going to her and then her telling me like, yeah, my friend told me what was your DP thinking when like you put her against this like overexposed white window and she's like, and I told her, I loved it. And and because the idea was like being so much in your head and being so much surrounded. Oh, by she's in white, shock. She's, yes, yeah, yes. By the white noise of the world that like everything almost melts and is, you know, the same way a white noise, what is it? It's hard to define, but you know, this tune, the same way it was like this, this blown out white limbo, like almost discomforting or like you know like almost this, this this cringing ominous presence of of something that was trauma and it wasn't so much thought about before like we had conversation over you know the themes and how to approach it and the color and the evolution but that it was something that just happened on set when you are on set and you see what you're given and it was like and it just clicks and you just put the lights and you overexpose which is something I usually don't do I don't like blowing out windows but there it made sense emotionally and 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 Shatara just responded one of my producers who is also editor uh we we spent a long time editing you know three days a week when we both had time to get together and and finish the film and I, I had made some strong choices about um, the the film is set in the winter time, so I wanted everything desaturated and grey, and the sea is grey and brown, you know, and the and the house was but this pale pale blue, and um, and I was being told, no, you've got to color, you've got to colorize it because it looks like you haven't passed it through a grade if you leave it like that. I said, but I don't. But that's what I want it to look like. I, it's cold. And that says to me how it was on the day when we shot it. I don't want to ping it in any way to to heighten anything. The opposite. Tons of pushback, tons of pushback. And mm -hmm. Mikey said to me, he said, look, 30 years ago, a director would get fired if there was a flare in the lens. Like you shot, the, you put the lens into the sun and that's not what we do. You're fired," he said. "Nowadays, you see, so so now so now you see flares everywhere, and they they're this beautiful you know sunset light, and we all enjoy them for what they are. But he said one day somebody's going to look back at your your debut feature and go, look what she did there. She she barely colorized it. She barely." took any of the layers that you can add to it, which are valuable when you need them. He said, and then it'll be a thing. It'll be a thing. You know, Boyd did that back in, you know, 2017. And now everybody's, nobody's paying. The colorists are all out of work because <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's that, it's that you did something <laughs> that on the, had, had involved discussion that involved also a gut feeling and an emotion, dare I say. And, and you get, you somebody goes what did you do that for i i did that i did that it's called art and it's called creativity and it's called the way me and the director has decided to tell the story fascinating fast and again when you get these experiences you think you're alone and you're really not because when you're a pioneer love you know <laughs> when you're a pioneer <laughs> no and also i think it like comes back to you know, like it's it's one thing if I had a pushback from the director. I mean, there were times where like I was doing something and like Shiva was coming to set and she was like, "I hate that. I don't know why, but I do." And I was like, "Okay, 
great, I'll figure it out. You know, you know, so if the pushback is from the person who's like the story has come from, then no, obviously. But there are times where like you have to be intentional in your choices and especially if you can, especially if you have like the advantage of being able to do so, like, which is rare, you know, sometimes because you don't have the resources, sometimes because you have too many resources and too many voices and, you know. Yes. Or it's a TV show and and the tone and the style is set and you're, you, you know, you're, you're, you've got a, you've got a brief and, and that's fair enough. But you're right. This independent film world is the one place at the beginning of our careers where we can take a little risk and then you do everybody else's job. And then at the end of your career, when you're when you've been deemed an auteur, then you can then you can do what you want again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's it's important because, again, uh, the point is not like you're never going to please everyone. The, the goal is not to please anyone. But the goal is like, yeah, if somebody comes to you and it's like notice a decision that didn't take them out of the movie because, you know, you don't want to take pe- the audience out, out of the movie. But. But that, like, enhanced some that, that, that like created something, create a response or like trigger a response. Then you've done your job, you know. That's fantastic. Have you? I, I I'm dying to see the whole film now, especially. Um, and it's not the same film at all, but it covers the same subject. I enjoyed uh, Promising Young Woman so much because of that that subject of of how. Um, and and how the female gaze told the story differently. Uh, a female writer, director, and and producers how they told that story so differently from other you know uh, rape stories or date rape stories. It was it was very clever. It's a joy to see women finding their voices and having the wherewithal to to make films that are important to us and told in the way we want to tell them from our point of view. And and they are definitely different. Yeah. And I think, again, like, I think it's important to just, like, have more. I think, like, we're all aspiring to, like, I think this push for diversity, which, you know, sometimes it gets a little too on the nose, but I think it's necessary just so we can all get to a place where, like, yes, there is not one perspective that has been that like dominates the the movie industry for decades and decades. No, there's a multitude of perspectives out there, and they all, you know, come from different um, experience. But they like, but they're all available for us to watch and learn from and and educate our eye and like, so we can pick and choose what we like and what we don't like and why again because we need to to go back to a place for art where art is um you know a commentary on the world and and but the world is complex the human experience is complex and we need to go back and like abandon this idea of like good and bad black and white and go back to something where like we can hold two opposite like we can all dichotomies we can all uh your opposite ideas at once and we can hold opposite perspective at once to create something you know more I don't know exquisite and I think that's something I'm missing the only thing that like I'm missing from Europe not the only but one other thing I'm missing from Europe is that I feel in Europe we are exposed uh to a wider variety of art in general and of cinema like I remember growing up with like Korean movies Czechoslovakian movies Russian movies American movies while in America the mainstream is really present and like even accessing you know movies that went to like the main festival like Cannes or Venice that are not uh American or supported by an American co-production is physically impossible and that's you know tricky as a filmmaker I think I think maybe I think maybe though because of streaming services and because you don't now we now know you don't have to see every single film you watch in the cinema because 
you know, I know that for the first time, when I became a filmmaker, I bought the biggest television in my, I'd ever bought in my life because I felt like, no, I owe it to myself and I owe it to the filmmakers. If I'm not going to watch this film or I've seen it in the cinema now, I want to watch it again. I want to watch it in... In a, in a lovely wide screen, as wide as my room will fit screen environment. There are ways for us to expose ourselves to more independent film, more foreign films. Um, and, and I guess it's still up to the individual. But um, yeah, it's, it's the noise of the Marvel Studios is very, very loud. Even though, even though there's hope because... Uh, their new Marvel that's coming out uh, was directed by Chloe Zhao, who won the Oscar as the first woman of color. Like, so, you know, maybe there's room for improvement. Again, there's room for multitudes, for variety, for like the usual Marvel and something more experimental. Like, let's just open it up. There's like, we can consume more than one type of movie. Yes, indeed, indeed. Well, that's that's a wonderful place to end. Ludovica, what an amazing person to talk to. I, I learned so much myself um, and I loved, I can't wait to see Test Pattern. Do you have anything coming up that, or anything that is in the works that will be out soon that we can look for? Uh, I know, I shot a feature, a horror, psychological horror in Binghamton, New York. Uh, a couple of months ago and is now in post and I will be shooting another feature in a couple of weeks um, and um, I will have a baby popping out of me in a few months so there's a few things oh my gosh <laughs> that's just a few things oh my gosh and you're going to be so you're going to be shooting a feature film while you're eight months pregnant uh, no I will be six and a half but yes the idea the hope is to keep working basically until a couple of weeks before i'm due uh because yes women can work pregnant and yes we will never jeopardize our, our pregnancy so if we tell you that we are absolutely fine working we are trust us because it's our body and our baby so you know we can tell the difference that's fantastic. Well, congratulations in advance. Thank you. And um, yeah, it's, that, it's, it's been just a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Fierce Female Filmmakers is a production of Artemisia's Daughters. For more information, go to artemisiasdaughters.org. Our theme tune is composed by Charlie Mackey.